What is going on everybody? Welcome back to XJW Diaries. My name is Justin. So today, today we're going to break one of the big rules. We're going to question the governing body's leadership. And if you look at what's going on, especially in the last 12 to 18 months, I mean, how can you not question them? How can you not wonder what in the world is the Watchtower leadership doing? Do they know what they're doing? And do they know how what they're doing impacts their members? So I have my own opinions on what I think is going on. Let me know what you think is going on down in the comments below. But if you're someone who's just waking up and you're going through this period where you're having a hard time questioning the Watchtower's leadership, when you watch this video, really ask yourself, are these leaders that are worthy of following? Especially are these leaders that are worthy of following blindly? Because that is what they expect from all Jehovah's Witnesses. Especially when they say these terms, these loaded phrases like, do not question Jehovah's direction. Speaking of the direction of the governing body. So let's start with one of the big leadership changes that we saw last year, actually, which was the very mysterious exit of Tony Morris from the governing body. And then around that same time period, we saw two new governing body members added. Now, just the way that Tony Morris was removed, it really shows how the Jehovah's Witness leaders view their members. There was hardly even an announcement. Think of how big of a position being on the governing body is, especially for all those years. And there was barely a peep when he was removed. There was no reason given. There was no thank you to Tony Morris for all your years of serving. There was nothing. In fact, I'm sure months went by and some witnesses didn't even know that Tony and Morris was no longer a governing body member. And if you read Crisis of Conscience, this mysteriousness, it shouldn't even be a surprise. Ray Franz talks about in that book how the Jehovah's Witness leaders view the members as if they're little children unable to think for themselves, unable to do any amount of critical thinking. And so there's this mystique that's put over everything. There's these vague descriptions, these vague announcements that are given, but truly everybody's in the dark. Now, obviously this mysteriousness about where or where is Tony Morris has sparked a lot of theories, but my theory has always stayed the same. And it's that Tony Morris was very sternly asked to step down because he's bad for business. The Watchtower is just like any other corporation. They have to show projected growth. To some extent, they even have to show profits. And Tony Morris, I think, was bad for growth, bad for business. Now, in one of my videos, I talked about how the Watchtower's current trajectory is just not good. They're on a crash course. They can't keep going the way that they're going. And I talked about how eventually they're going to have to choose. Do they want to go more conservative, make the religion even more strict to hold on tighter to the members that they already have? Or do they go the other way, make the religion more liberal, loosen up the grip a little bit, make it slightly easier for people to join, make it slightly easier for people to stay. And I think they chose to go with the slightly more liberal Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think Tony Morris was one of the people that was really fighting to keep the old watchtower, to keep things going the way that they were going or to make things more strict. Again, I think Tony Morris was bad for business. Now, over the past few months, we've seen the watchtower make some very liberal, loosen up the grip type of moves, right? It started off with the annual meeting where they announced that publishers no longer needed to turn in their service hours every month. For years, people have been judged about how spiritual they are based on what number they put on their timesheet. In fact, in my own case, for years of trying and trying and years of getting overlooked, it came to a point where I was going to meetings by myself. They called me a spiritual orphan because my whole family had stopped going to meetings. It was just me. And after a year of doing that, an elder finally came up to me and said, you know, we see you're trying. We see you're reaching out. 
what do you think about becoming a ministerial server? And I said, yes, yes, please. So then a couple months go by and I'm out in service with another elder. And that other elder talks to me about becoming a ministerial server. And he says to me, he says, you know, it will be easier to recommend you if you kept your hours at around 10 hours every month. And so I did that. I kept my hours at 10 hours or more every single month. And before I knew it, I got a text message from one of the elders saying that the circuit overseer wants to meet with me. And during that meeting, I was appointed a ministerial servant, all because of some hours on a sheet. So they've made such a big deal about this hourly requirement only to just throw it away like it never mattered. Now, if you're going through the process of waking up, you should be questioning that. You should be asking yourself, why was I straining for all these years? Why was I judged for all these years? Why was I pestered by elders? Where's your service time? Where's your service time for all these years? For something that was thrown away like it never even mattered. Another liberal change that we've seen is the relaxing of the way that they view college, higher education. A letter was sent to all elders and it leaked out, got into the community, and here's what it says. While the faithful slave has long provided loving counsel on the dangers of pursuing higher education, it should be noted that following such a course is not outlawed in the Christian congregation. Therefore, it is not necessary or wise for elders to create rigid rules on such matters especially as the faithful slave has not done so. Now let's just stop right here because they are lying. They're lying right here. If you've been a witness for any good amount of time, you know this is a lie. The governing body has promoted in many, many ways not to pursue higher education. Every single year during the assemblies, they're putting up people as demonstrations. Kids who have refused a scholarship so that they can pursue uh, full-time work in Jehovah's service. And they're put up as examples for other youth to follow. Every year there are multiple articles. There are demonstrations in the JW broadcast videos. There are talks. The list goes on every single year, multiple times a year. They are telling young people to not pursue higher education right from the leadership. And here they're saying, ah, we never said that. Straight up gaslighting. So then the letter continues, rather elders should be guided by scriptural principles and assess each case on its own merits. The Shepherd Book chapter eight, paragraph 30, helps us in this regard by posing a number of questions for elders to consider. Having considered such questions, if a brother who is pursuing higher education satisfies the scriptural requirements for an appointed man in every other respects, there is no reason why he cannot serve as an elder or a ministerial servant. And so here they're saying this, after all of these years of them saying that you cannot even be appointed a pioneer if you were enrolled in a university. There were elders who were removed from their position because their child wanted to go to a university. So it'll definitely be interesting to see how this gets uh, enforced at the congregation level. But for any of Jehovah's Witnesses out there, apparently your governing body leaders are telling you that they never cared about higher education, that that was all you. Here we go back to 1975 all over again. But let's continue because just recently there was another change, this time around something that is very natural, beards, men having beards. For years, Jehovah's Witness men have had to be clean shaven, especially if they want to serve in any, any way. You had to be clean shaven. In fact, it was such a big rule that in my congregation, and I know many other congregations that have the same rule, if on a Sunday meeting you had a visiting brother, you also had to have at least a couple other ministerial servants or elders within your own congregation who had talks ready to go. That way, if the brother from another congregation shows up and he was unshaved, he would be refused access to the stage and one of the brothers from the local congregation would go up and give one of their outlines instead. And the other brother would be sent back home. That's how serious it was. And yet now, 
Here's what they're saying. The governing body has asked me to read the following announcement. A number of branch offices around the world have written to us indicating that there continue to be questions about whether or not it is proper for a brother in an appointed position to wear a beard. After prayerful consideration, the governing body has concluded that there is a need to clarify this matter. The governing body does not have an issue with brothers wearing beards. Why not? Because the scriptures do not condemn the wearing of beards. Furthermore, as time has passed, we have noted that in many lands, it is acceptable for men who hold responsible positions in business and government to wear beards. Thus, whether a brother wears a beard is a personal decision. A brother's qualifications to serve as an elder or ministerial servant are based on his spirituality, not on whether he chooses to wear a beard. This direction also applies to special full-time servants at Bethel and those in the field, including special pioneers, missionaries, and circuit overseers. In harmony with Romans 14.4, neither the elders nor any other Christian should feel compelled to judge a brother who chooses to wear a beard. So just like with college, just like with the hourly requirement, the beard situation has been thrown away as if it never mattered. Because really, it didn't ever matter. Really, all of these things were never in the Bible in the first place. And yet, all of these things were heavily enforced by the Watchtower leaders. The very same leaders who right now are saying, it doesn't matter. You know, if you went back even just six months ago, if you were a brother who had a beard, who was attending university and who wasn't really turning in very many hours every month, you were considered bad association. There was no way you would even think of asking to be appointed a ministerial servant or an elder. Fast forward to today, that very same person is now acceptable for a position. So on one hand, this just shows the gaslighting that's coming from the Jehovah's Witness leaders. Again, just like 1975. They're saying all these things, they put all these things on their members, and when it comes back on them, they say, well, that wasn't us, that was you guys. That was you. You know, when you look up the top qualities that every good leader should have, one of the things that you will see most often on those lists is empathy. But in these changes, there is no empathy. There is no empathy from the Watchtower leaders. Again, for all those years that they held it over people's heads to turn in massive amounts of hours in order to be recognized, in order to be recommended for a position. After all those years of telling men that they must be shaved, regardless of what the culture is, this is the Jehovah's Witness culture. And the Jehovah's Witness culture says you must be shaved. And regardless of all the years that they have discouraged higher education, there is no sorry, there is no thank you. There's just these things never mattered in the first place. And we've seen this exact same attitude when it comes to health matters, this lack of empathy. Back in the day, it was considered cannibalism. It was strictly forbidden to get an organ transplant. Later on, same as these situations. Well, it doesn't matter. It's a personal choice. Now, in the time between them saying it's forbidden and them all of a sudden realizing that's a personal choice, in that gap of time there, Real people died. Real, actual people died. Same thing with the blood. Before, they were saying, all blood is forbidden. Later on, they said, well, blood fractions are okay. Personal choice. Again, in that time frame, 
somebody's life could have been saved by one of those blood fractions. But in that time frame, it was forbidden. No empathy for those people. No empathy for those people that lost their lives. Now, another trait that all good leaders must have is integrity. Integrity means that regardless of who's watching, regardless of if there's an audience or not, you're going to keep going in the same direction. You're going to make the same decisions. Now, the Jehovah's Witness leaders have proven that they don't do this. In fact, I saw this myself during the time I was waking up when the Australian Royal Commission was going on and they brought Jeffrey Jackson to the stand and they basically asked him, is it true that you guys believe you are the one and only true religion that speaks for God? And Jeffrey Jackson's response was, it would be quite presumptuous. I'll never forget those words. It would be quite presumptuous. And yet we know that Jehovah's Witnesses do believe that they are the one and only true religion. They do believe that Jesus in 1919 came and personally picked them. They do believe that the governing body is the one and only true mouthpiece on earth. And yet on trial, under oath, having put his hand on his own Bible, they lied about it because there's an audience. Another big change that we've seen recently is this new light about how Armageddon is handled, how your ticket into paradise is handled. It used to be that you had to live your life as a Jehovah's Witness. You had to live that lifestyle. You had to have been living that lifestyle in order to be accepted into paradise. Now they're saying, well, you can repent at the last minute and you can still get in. So again, they seem to be changing things depending on if there's an audience or not. And right now there is an audience. Right now they are under the microscope. And I think they know that from the outside looking in, their doctrine makes them look like some crazy extremist doomsday cult. And to be honest, that's kind of what they are. This is a group of people that really is sitting around waiting for the end of the world. The movie came out on Netflix the other day, uh, probably this past week, uh, Leave the World Behind. That's what it's called, Leave the World Behind. I kind of liked it actually. I tell you what, that movie, is like a dream come true for Jehovah's Witnesses. They want that to happen. So I think what has happened already and what will continue happening is the Watchtower will continue to relax some things, continue to make these changes to make themselves look less and less extremist. Now, the really scary thing for the Watchtower leaders right now is that they're not only being watched from the outside, they're being watched from the inside. And this is kind of their own fault. You know, back when I was first joining the Jehovah's Witnesses, you didn't really know who the governing body members were. They were this kind of mystique group of people off in New York who made the decisions. But nowadays, the governing body is very, very public. Nowadays, they're almost treated like celebrities. People go to Bethel and they want their Bibles autographed by the governing body. J just think about that for a second. The Bible says, serve God, not man. And yet you have Jehovah's Witnesses who are going to the headquarters and wanting their Bible signed by governing body members. But anyway, on Rick Farron's show, Six Screens, he talked about last week how he heard from a soaker overseer who was saying to the congregation that he's noticed that everybody's burned out. In multiple congregations, Jehovah's Witnesses are burned out. And when people get burned out, what happens? A lot of them start questioning, well, why am I doing this in the first place? Now, another big factor of this is, of course, the pandemic. If you were a Jehovah's Witness, a faithful Jehovah's Witness, and you saw the events of 2020, you probably thought that was the beginning of Armageddon. You've been waiting for this your whole life. Now, fast forward to 2023. I mean, some people say it's back to normal. I don't think things are ever going to be quite the same, but for sure, We've moved forward. And for a Jehovah's Witness, that can be really confusing. Now, if you're still waking up, you need to ask yourself, do you want to follow leaders that will change their course depending on who's watching? Now, another quality that every good leader should have is to lead by example, not by intimidation. Now, we've seen through the judicial committees, we've seen through the shunning, 
We've seen through the use of guilt and fear and shame that the Jehovah's Witness leaders do lead through intimidation. But it's not just through those obvious things. It's also through their loaded language. If you were a Jehovah's Witness, you probably heard the saying, do not move ahead of Jehovah's chariot. And what that really is at the base, that's a thought stopping mechanism to make it so you stop thinking. But if you dive into that saying a little bit, that is 100% textbook bad leadership. This is something that they say when someone is thinking too forward. Ah, brother, sister, do not move ahead of Jehovah's chariot, right? Now, if what they're saying is true, let, let's, just, let's just pretend that what they're saying is true. If that were the case, then we're talking about Jehovah here. We're talking about the God of universe, a very advanced spiritual being that exists outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter. It would be impossible for you, no matter how smart you are, it would be impossible for you to move ahead of Jehovah's chariot. Impossible. So on a grounded level, what are they really saying when they say those type of words? What they're actually saying in plain English is, you slow down so that I can lead. That's what they're saying. You slow down so that I can lead. Again, textbook bad leadership. This is leadership through intimidation, not by example. So again, the question was, what are the Watchtower leaders doing? And if you ask me, I think, number one, they're in reactive mode. They are trying to avoid having a spillage of all their members leaving at once. The mass exodus that many of us on the XJW side have been saying, you know, eventually that's going to happen. And I think they're going to do it to themselves with these kind of changes, with this lack of empathy, this lack of integrity, and this leading through intimidation. So with that, I want to thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your time. Again, let us know, what do you think the Watchtower leaders are doing? Why are they making all of these big changes all of a sudden, one right after the other, and making changes for things that just six months ago were a very, very big deal. And now they've been thrown away like they're nothing. Again, if you are someone who's just waking up, ask yourself, is, is this the type of leadership that is worthy of being followed? Is this the type of leadership that's worthy of being blindly followed? leaders who have no empathy, no integrity, and who lead by intimidation.